This is Defender Radio. Defender Radio is brought to you by the Association for the Protection of Fur-Bearing Animals. It's the week of May 15, 2017, and this is Michael Howie welcoming you to episode 429 of Defender Radio. I've been looking forward to this interview for a couple of weeks. Dr. Mark Beckoff is one of my favorite researchers and authors, and he's played a big role in how I think and write about non-human animals. This episode marks the fourth time he's been on the show. Now remember that good things come to those who wait, so bear with me for a moment. We've had a wonderful success with the Celebrating Castor Canadensis t-shirt fundraiser at the Fur Bears, raising more than $300 for our Living with Wildlife Beavers program. That's one of my favorites, and it's how we're able to get into communities across the country and both teach and implement solutions that literally save the lives of beavers. The shirt sale only lasts until May 21st, so head to thefurbears.com while there's still time to get your limited edition tea. I also want to let you know that I have a new podcast that's now online, separate from the Fur Bears and Defender Radio, called The Everyday Fray. It's in the same format as Defender Radio. It's curiosity-driven and interview style, but it focuses on mental health and wellness. This is an important topic to me as I live with generalized anxiety disorder. You can hear more about my journey in the first episode at everydayfraypodcast.com. I'll be interviewing experts, survivors, other podcasters, and more. So please do join me in this new adventure. When we hear the word compassionate paired with non-human animals, our first thoughts often go to Dr. Mark Beckoff, a highly esteemed field biologist, animal behavior researcher, author, and speaker. Mark has penned multiple books, essays, and papers on concepts of compassionate conservation, compassionate choices, and the sentience of animals with whom we share the world. Mark, along with bioethicist and past collaborator Dr. Jessica Pierce, has released a new book, The Animal's Agenda, Freedom, Compassion, and Coexistence in the Human Age. This book, which is reviewed at thefurbears.com, takes readers on a journey of knowledge showing why, to truly provide freedom for non-human animals, we must first ask ourselves hard questions around topics involving food, medical research, entertainment, and, of course, wildlife and the environment. Mark and Jessica set out a clear path away from what they hypothesize is the failure of animal welfare and toward what they call animal well-being, as well as why science, which has illustrated the sentience and deep emotional lives of many animals, has not produced more obvious changes in our society. To discuss this recent book and walk through some of the amusing anecdotes, at times uncomfortable questions, and possible solutions to moving toward an age of compassion for all living beings that they labeled as the compassionocene. Mark joined Defender Radio. What was the initial thought behind doing this book? Uh, I mean, you've done many books on many subjects now. This one feels sort of like a scattergun (coughs) with a very specific target nonetheless. Right. Uh, How did you develop the concept Uh, between yourself and your co-author on this book? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we talked a lot about um, doing a book like this for a long time until around December 2013, right before Christmas. A lot of things gelled. I'd say the the two major things that motivated us were, number one, our dissatisfaction with the science of animal welfare, and number two, this um, lack of translation of what we know into um, being used on behalf of other animals. So with respect to the first point, we argue for replacing the science of animal welfare with the science of animal well-being. With respect to the second point, we develop what we call the knowledge translation gap, where we argue that, you know, we have to be better at using what we know, say, about the cognitive and moral, cognitive and emotional lives of animals and their moral lives, um, we have to be better at using those data to uh, work on behalf of the other animals. And um, so that was basically it. I can develop each of those if you want in a bit, but that, that was basically it. And also the recognition that 
the use of animals is not dwindling, as some people argue. You know, in some venues, it's getting, um, it's growing, like meat eating, the use of lab animals, you know, um, you know, in the United States, mice and rats are not recognized as animals in the Federal Animal Welfare Act. So, you know, you wonder how can, you know, they're surely not plants. And I know that sounds facetious, but the scientists themselves don't come out on behalf of the animals. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done, Michael. <laughs> well, you've started it for sure. Um, and uh, along with many other people. Um, but you, uh, what I found in this book, and some of these are concepts that you know, people who are familiar with your writing and your work will be uh, familiar with. And you have a way of creating sort of a new catchphrase or term uh, as you write about some of these things, particularly, you know, when we talked about in the past compassionate conservation, we talk about animal or uh, I'm sorry, personal rewilding. And you sort of you find an, an easy way to explain what some of these big concepts are. And one that you immediately introduce is the difference between animal welfare and animal well-being. And this, for me, this is really the, the crux of the entire concept. Uh, so could you provide the sort of the defining difference between those, you know, animal welfare as we know, and what this new concept of animal well-being is? Sure. I mean, animal welfare patronizes other animals. Um, certainly, there's welfareists who are doing better by other animals, and they'll say we're giving them a better life. But a better life isn't necessarily a good life. It's just a better life. And welfare yields to the interests of humans. So all of the advances, you've got the five freedoms that were developed in the 60s for farmed animals in the UK, and they've recently been modified and expanded somewhat into what a um, person named David Miller calls the five domains. But no matter how you cash it out, they are all basically constructed to use animals in very invasive ways in the name of humans. And so you'll see little caveats that we're going to give them the best lives we can. However, we're going to have to use them for food and laboratories, keep them as pets, you know, use them in entertainment like a sea world and other types of zoos. So those are the constraints. And Welfare fails other animals. Um, the science of animal well-being or looking at animal well-being basically focus on, focuses on individual animals. So we wouldn't say, well, we've got 10,000, you know, we've got invasive brown rats. There's a million of them, so it's okay to kill 10,000 or 5,000 of them because each individual who's killed cares about what happens to him or to her. So it's a focus on the interests of individual animals to live in peace and safety. And, you know, for some people, it's a minor, for some people, it's subtle. There was a review of our book that we really liked how the reviewer cashed it out. I don't remember the exact words, but it was like the difference is subtle, but absolutely powerful, he said. And so we agree. So that those would be the difference. Welfare looks at animals as members of a species or a group. Well-being looks at individual animals, each of whom has an interest in having a life free of pain and suffering and harm. And one of the points you come back to uh, regularly, and again, this this is the one of the threads throughout the book, is, uh, and I'm going to read parts of a passage, um, there's been a strong feeling of hope that science can save the animals. Uh, you and your co-author both felt this. But for many people working in animal protection, optimism is giving way to disappointment and frustration. So as we're getting more and more knowledge, um, the animals are, in many ways, and this is the quote, worse off now than they were in the 1960s. It's reasonable to ask, how can this be? And that's the knowledge gap you spoke about. And that, I, I was trying to explain that to Kate after I had read it, and he, we, I, I had to go back and read it from my copy of the book. Right. Um, but it, it is a, a remarkable concept that this occurs because you wouldn't see that in many, many other places. 
uh, uh, you know, if we were to look at, you know, say building a car engine, we know what works and what doesn't work. Exactly. And when something doesn't work or we can do it better, we leave it behind. Yes. And we move forward. But with animal welfare, in particular, animal well-being, uh, and our understanding of, of uh, sentient animals, we continue to act and treat them in much the same way. And arguably, in some cases, even worse. Yes. And, and worse if you will, given what we know. In other words, you know, it's, it's the same sorts of animals are subjected to the same sorts of harms, but, and they don't suffer maybe more today than they did, you know, five or 10 years ago, but we're doing it despite the fact that we know who they are and how, how much information we have about their cognitive and their emotional lives. So that would be the knowledge translation gap, you know, in effect, we're not using what we know and that would be the welfare paradigm, which basically says, yes, we want to do the best we can for the animals, but it's all defined in a hu- from the use of them in the name of humans. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we, we provide a lot of examples. You know, the other thing is, and you and I have spoken a lot about compassionate conservation, the, pr- the first principle of, or the first two principles of um, compassionate conservation are first do no harm and the lives of every individual matter. And so that's basically the driving force between the science of animal well-being and compassionate conservation. So there's a connection there, which, which might not be surprising to you or to readers, given that, you know, I work in both areas. Mm -hmm. Um, Um, Yeah. And it's, I, I, I got frustrated because as I read this, I was, I was taking my notes as I do when I'm reviewing something. And every time I'd come to a point where I'd go, ah, they didn't answer this question. And I'd make my little note to bring it up during our talk. And then like I turn the page and there's the answer. Um, <laughs> so you, you did not allow me to feel smart. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you for saying that. I mean, the book took a lot of work. I mean, books take a lot of work, but... Jessica and I, we also did a book called Wild Justice, and a few people have told us the same, made the same comment. Um, It took a lot of work. We worked really, really hard on it. And she brings a different perspective. You know, I'm a field biologist. I mean, I've written on ethics, but, you know, I'm a field biologist. I do a lot of work in the area of cognitive ethology. Jessica is very well known around the world as a bioethicist. She's done a lot of work on bioethics and medical bioethics. So some people think it might be an unlikely blend in terms of the way we work, but we work seamlessly together. So I often, you know, write something and she edits it and and vice versa. And sometimes I will simplify certain, some of the philosophy and she'll make more accessible some of the science. So um, we're, we're, we're a good team. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely agree. And that's, you know, it's, it's as a, uh, uh, a person who wants to, to have a, a very lively interview, it's frustrating, but as a reader and someone who appreciates this work, it's, it's very well done. Uh, one, one thing I was very curious about, and it gets touched on, um, very briefly near the beginning of the book is the concept that, uh, freedom, which again is is the central theme, I think, behind much of this, is, is that concept of having yes. freedom. Uh, and I like the quotes uh, that you use. Um, you know, it's hard to define, but you know when it's been taken away. Um, and I, I found it interesting, the concept of stating that freedom is always going to be something of a gray area. Defining it will always be a little gray, but we have to look mm-hmm. at it. Yeah, or we have to look at our efforts in a black and white manner. Um, and that's something I found very different uh, from what I read in a lot of other places. You don't often hear someone say there's gray area and that's okay. Uh, so how, like, how do you sort of settle that? We need to do this. We need to treat it in this way. But at the same time, there's no black and white answer. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, of course. Um, well, the gray area has can, has to do with a number of things. The first would be the individuals. Like, you know, you and I, we all want to live um, 
safely, peacefully, absent pain and suffering and, you know, different sorts of harms and death. Um, you know, so, you know, that that's a given. But then immediately you and I are different people. So what I view as an intrusion on one or more of my freedoms, you might not and vice versa. So that's where the importance of the individual comes in is knowing who they are. And so since like there's no such thing as the dog or the coyote or the lab mice or the lab rats, we can assume, or birds, fish, mammals, insects, we can assume that all of those beings want to have the best life possible absent, you know, invasive research on them, pain, suffering, and death. Um, but then it gets tricky because what might be tolerant, to tolerable for a dog, one dog or a coyote or a mouse might not be for another. And that's where the challenge comes in is to be sure that you know each individual being as an individual being and decide that Mark doesn't like this, but likes that. But Michael doesn't like that, but likes this. Um, that's the challenge. And that's why it's so important not only to use the data we have available, but why it's also important to um, focus on individual um, desires. And that leads into an interesting question. This is something I, I have seen in other books about uh, uh, typically animal testing or animal consciousness um, and so on is – um, that in order to be able to protect these animals or, or provide them the freedoms uh, that they, they need uh, and want, we have to study them. Uh, there has to be science. We have to research. And there's uh, uh, in the very excellent and robust chapter on uh, farm animals, this comes up a lot, talking in particular about, uh, I believe it was the battery chickens and stuff and determining what kind of caging they prefer Yeah, and how the failings of the science sort of hits that in particular because we're giving them limited choices. But the the ethical question that I kind of come up against is uh, how, how do we test on animals to find out what they need and want, but also be okay with the fact that we're testing on animals who are in confinement? Like it's it's sort of a, a catch twenty two feeling thing. Oh, for sure. I mean, preference tests are helpful, um, but they can also be feel good types of improvements. You know, people go, "Well, we're going to give the elephants in our zoo three acres rather than one." Big deal. It's no big deal difference to an elephant. Or, you know, the chicken one comes down to giving them 68 or 72 square inches of floor space. I mean, give me a break. That's like saying, would you like a home of 900 or 905 square feet? Yeah. Right. And so, so um, the question of how you test them, these things, there's data. I mean, you know, once again, it comes down to individuals. Like you've talked to me about the differences among the dogs with whom you share your house, and I've had the same differences. I think the baseline is, is that gratuitous, unnecessary, invasive, or invasions into animals' lives are not tolerable. And the assumption that all individuals want to live in peace and safety, absent harm and pain, pain suffering, and death, um, that's universal. Some of it's common sense. I mean, you know, you, you just, you know, you can put your, you can put a dog in a broom closet all day and they'll come out and be happy to see you and lick their face. But, you know, in terms of say farm animals, no, no, no farm animal wants to go to the killing floor of a slaughterhouse, yeah. either be bolted in the head or have their throats cut. I mean, so so when people go, well, you know, we're doing it humanely, like Temple Grandin, who we write about in the book, I mean, give me a break, right? I mean, you know, she, I mean, if she's improving the lives of animals, it's probably a fraction of a percent of the millions upon millions of animals in industrial agriculture. And once again, making them a, it better doesn't really make it good. And so it's kind of a, I call it a feel-good scam, you know, or sham. That's 
that's what it is. Um, so she has her stairways to heaven, which is what she calls the final walk of these cows. And I, I bristle when I think of that. I mean, it's a stairway to hell. It's a stairway to death. Um, getting away from that, you know, you can start to consider wild animals and how we intrude into their lives and make their lives difficult. You can look at urban animals, like all the urban cougars and black bears and foxes and coyotes around Boulder and, you know, thousands upon thousands of other cities, you know, cause it's like dominoes. We've moved into their place. We don't, into their homes. We harm them and their children. And then we expect them to just be fine. And they're not. Yeah. They move around and then because of us, you know, we then impose certain extreme restrictions on their freedoms um, because of in the name of humans, not in the name of them. People say, well, yeah, you know, you can't have bears in Boulder, black bears in Boulder because they'll get hit by cars. Well, they they wouldn't be here if we didn't move into their mountain homes. Yeah. Right. So um, so it's difficult. Um, but. But you can do you. There are tests you can do. You can do studies where you find out what individuals prefer. I don't mean that as a license to use them, but but creative people are doing more non-invasive work now, and getting um, really good access into the cognitive and emotional lives of these animals. Well, and I think technology probably plays a pretty big role in that. I mean, you know, we're learning yeah. about uh, uh, one of the um, scientists I, I quite like following, uh, Doctor. Suzanne McDonald uh, at York University is doing some research on raccoons and their creative mm-hmm. puzzle uh, solving and stuff. And she just sets up night cams and walks away, right? Mm-hmm. Like she, she does not need to tag. She doesn't need to, to touch or go near the animals. She can watch them from far away uh, from the other side of the world, really, if she wanted to because of that technology. Uh, and, you know, there's you, you have a note, and I want to come back to the wolf story, uh, using uh, hair samples, uh, uh-huh. you can do with the little barbs, right? Like it does not need to be uh dart capture tag, et cetera. Right. Um, so that's, that's probably giving us a lot of sort of it, at, at the very least in the, uh, uh, wildlife side of it. But I imagine those technologies also translate over. Um, and this was uncomfortable for me to read. So I imagine it was probably the result of many lengthy conversations. Um, <laughs> and it's talking about, Welfare science not being enough, and it's a very clear argument. So you can, and that's this is your your knowledge translation, the knowledge gap, where you say we've got all of this information that talks about, um, you know, what we know about these animals, and yet we're still doing all of these things to them. So, welfare science is not enough. Animal welfare is not enough. But at the same time, there are points where, uh, you know, it it. it talks you, you do mention that it continues to be extremely valuable um but then just sort of talking about how gestation crate bans are a huge step so this is for me one of the questions that always comes up is a gestation crate ban is good because gestation crates are horrible 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 things right but many people would argue there's no point in trying to ban gestation crates. We should try and stop people from killing pigs, period. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's the problem with Temple Grandin's work is that even if she were having a bigger, if she were having as big an effect as she thinks she is, things would be, quote, better. But she refuses to work to stop um, close down factory farms. Mm-hmm. But uh, so can we say, though, then that no longer using gestation crates is good. And it's, and as I, you know, I think the quote is, it's a step in the right direction from the book. And this, this is, this is for me, the uncomfortableness. And I'm, I don't know if it's, it's a form of dissonance or trying to figure this out that we can on one hand say these welfare improvements are good and necessary, but they'll never be enough. How do we sort of manage that? I mean, like I said, for me personally, it feels uncomfortable just to say it uh, and to read it. So how do we sort of accept that as the ultimate truth that we can always try and make it better? But as you put it, I think very aptly, it may never be good. Um, so do we, we, we certainly don't want to condemn improvements, though. 
Um, how do we communicate about this? In what you know, I, I feel like I need to sit and drink and think about to fully <laughs> well, understand. Right. I mean, a great example are the um, the um, changes that SeaWorld made last year about stopping their shows and stopping captive breeding and serving vegetarian and vegan food. Are those improvements? Yes. Should we applaud them? We should applaud them, but not to the point where it's implied or concluded that they're enough. Change is going to be shades of gray. So I've I've had people get very upset with me for lauding some of what SeaWorld and other places are doing, but what they're not reading. And I actually had a discussion a few months ago with somebody, and I finally had to say, please read the essay I wrote um, carefully, because I said, these are improvements, but we should work to close down SeaWorld, for example. That's what I said. So I'm not feeding into the system of maintaining the status quo. I'm basically saying change. In, there's a real world out there, unfortunately, and change in the world in the real world takes time, especially as it pertains to the use of uh, non-human animals by humans. Well, and that is, uh, and again, talking still about the farmed animals, the the very interesting arguments that come up. Um, you know, uh, uh, as you know, I am vegan, uh, and many other people who listen to the show are too. Yeah, and we we hear the same arguments, and one of them is um, a quote from Grandin that uh, is often paraphrased and repeated in wildlife as well, is that death in a well-managed, well-designed slaughterhouse is much less frightening or painful than death will likely be in the wild. And, you know, I, I know if you're sitting sort of in that academic setting, you can have a debate about this, but people who say that kind of thing just on the street or around the family dinner table genuinely believe that, um, you know, well, this this chicken got to look out a window for part of its life. Therefore, yeah. it's okay. Um, and the term that you use of humane washing, which is something that really needs to be discussed more. So that's another one I just, I, I have difficulty sort of with when we talk about the gray area, because it's, you know, our beliefs are, are similar, you and I, that we need to stop producing... Uh, raising, killing, and consuming some of these animals, most yeah. of these animals. And at the same time, that literally and figuratively and economically and environmentally could not happen overnight. Um, how do you approach that when we're talking about some of these these issues? The half-truths or the, uh, the they're sort of fallacies that are almost impossible to argue against. Yeah, well, I was at a meeting last week in, in Detroit, um, you know, on, um, on zoos. And some people have raised the issue that, well, life in the wild is tough. Yes, life in the wild can be tough. That's why we should keep animals in zoos. So I said, so why don't you just go round them all up? And I, I know that sounds a little flaky and um, facetious on my part. But life in the wild is life in the wild. And as a field biologist, I've seen numerous, numer I've seen thousands of um, coyote predatory encounters with small rodents, squirrels, field mice, and other um, rodent beings. And I never would think of stopping them. And on occasion, you see animals who starve um, you don't break up fights because that's the way the animals have evolved. But what people are saying, you know, cutting through the chase is that, you know, you give the animals, you know, a bed, food and veterinary care. And isn't that wonderful? Well, it, it's OK, but those that's not who the animals are. And so when people just say, well, life, you know, in captivity is easier or or life in the wild is very difficult so we're really doing the animals a favor my take is well it's just a to me it's a pretty vacuous um rationalization for keeping animals in captivity 
And it is, uh, it, it plays nicely into the concept that death is, a, is, uh, is not a harm. That comes up a few times in various chapters. Yes. Could you explain, yes. uh, I, I think maybe to start, why someone would say that and what your argument against it is? I wish I could. I wish Jessica, <laughs> were, I wish Jessica were on this call, but some of it comes into the fact that once an animal has, you know, including humans have passed, you know, their life is over and there will be no more harm. I, I don't know the detailed philosophy, Mike, but I really don't care. I, 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 I mean, when I first learned that people debate this, it, I thought that it was the most incredulous. I was incredulous that they debate whether death is a harm. And I know there's books and volumes about it. You know, um, some people say, well, death is the end of harm. And I'm thinking death is a harm um, in the sense that you've taken the life of an individual animal uh, unnecessarily, for example. So I'm not sure where to go with that other than, yeah, you know. It's, it's, it's not an easy one. And the unnecessarily is the, the, I think the key comment in that, uh, you know, before I became vegetarian and then vegan, um, I, one of the ways I got my brain around eating meat, uh, and dairy was that the death had purpose, right? The animal was born, raised and died. And there was a purpose to that and that's noble. So it's okay. And I think it's as you become more familiar with the alternatives, and the options and the choices. You know, I, I was talking with uh, Biff Nagin, the musician, uh, in our last episode, and she made the very simple point that there's always a compassionate choice that yeah, you can make. E exactly. And and there's always a, a humane choice you can make. Um, and people need to be exposed to them. Because, you know, there's a lot of people who don't know about what these animals are feeling or who they really are in terms of cognition and emotions. So you have to educate them and then you have to explain to them how the different ways in which you're interacting with them can be, you know, can be pleasant or could be harm harmful. Yeah. And I think too, we probably, and this may just be me, um, but in that inner dialogue, what comes to mind too is the concept of self-sacrifice. Um, and, you know, in our patriarchal society, particularly in North America, you think of, you know, the soldier jumping on the grenade in the, the trench as well. That's a noble mm -hmm. sacrifice. And then that same terminology is used in talking about, you know, uh, farmed animals or hunted animals, uh, that it was, an, it was a noble sacrifice of the animal to feed the people. Mm -hmm. And, right. 300 years ago, I think he might have had an argument. Uh, but now it's not necessary for our survival uh, by any stretch of the imagination. So I think that kind of rules oh, it out. No, exactly. No. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's not I easy. Don't. And I think that's what I enjoyed about the book. Uh, and I, I actually, yeah. I would find this one is a little more aggressive in that regard than a lot of your other writings that I'm familiar with. And I'm not sure if that's, you know, uh, with, with your, your colleague, Jessica, or if maybe it's the, f there, there's a, there's a bit of frustration that comes through in the writing. Uh, yeah. Um, I always blame her for pulling me to the left and she blames <laughs> me for pulling her to the left. No, <laughs> you're, you're right. I, I might not have used the word aggressive, but it, it's it's a much more progressive book. Asking, I, I come to, you know for a par for asking for a parad a paradigm shift for a revolution in how we think. Because I'll be honest with you, I'm just tired of reading papers and books that simply tell us how wonderful food animals or entertainment animals or lab animals or wild animals or companion animals are. We know that. And I'm tired of reading books that say we need to do better, but don't give ideas or suggestions as to how to do better, even, you know, in a practical or in a more sort of, I don't want to say scholarly, but in a more moral compass type of way. And 
the science of animal well-being is really a change in the moral compass. It just is. I mean, and 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 we don't mean it to be in people's face. I don't think there's anything in the book, um, or maybe there's a couple of things that are really aggressive in terms of, you know, the, the language and all that. But we're basically saying animal welfare fails at non-human animals because it favors human animals to the point of overriding the interests of non-humans when, when, when it has to be done. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think when I think aggressive, it's in that you're not pulling any punches. You're not comforting no. in saying this is a moral problem, that this is wrong. There's no, it's okay, you're learning. It's this is what it is. And it's your responsibility, dear reader, to do something about it. Exactly. So when so at the zoo meeting last week, it was really interesting. I mean, I wrote a paper just yesterday for Psych Today on sort of recapping the meeting, and um, there, you know, there were a couple of things that came up. One was a, a zoo director was saying that former uh, student of animal behavior saying he was frustrated that knowledge wasn't seeping down that they could use to help the animals. And he's right. That's what we call the knowledge translation gap. But as I pointed out in my article, and I mentioned actually at the meeting, we, you don't need more data to know that lions and elephants and birds and all the animals in, in zoos suffer um, and are sentient beings. So you might want more details, like we were talking about preferences for size of an enclosure or preferences for noise or odors, but we don't need more data to know that these animals are sentient beings who suffer when they lose their freedoms. The other thing that was said, and I wrote this in the paper, and um, people can find it on Psych Today, it's called, It's Still Not Happening at the Zoo, kind of taking off from a Simon and Garfunkel, Garfunkel song, is a guy on stage basically said that the zoo director who killed Marius, the, chimp, the, um, young, the young giraffe at the Cop Copenhagen Zoo because he wouldn't fit into their breeding program, otherwise healthy, and offers from other zoos to take him. A guy on stage said that the man who was responsible for making the decision to kill Marius was a hero. I, I don't, I mean, I've heard pretty perverse things in my life, but that really took the boat in the animal arena, that a guy who decides to kill non-human animals in zoos who are otherwise healthy because they can't be bred is a hero. I, and I'll tell you, there was a gasp in the audience and he prefaced saying it that most people in the audience, including the hundreds of quote zoo people who were there would not be happy hearing it. But to me, that was, I, I thought about it for a long time and just, I think it was yesterday morning I got time to write up this essay. And then I've had emails from people saying, seriously? I mean, not that they thought I was lying. So Yeah, but just I mean, you don't expect to hear that. No, you don't expect to hear that people who go out and kill non-human animals because, um, you know, otherwise healthy animals. And the other thing, of course, is he kept using the word, you know, called and sacrificed and euthanized and I've created the word euth euthanized because it's not euthanasia to kill Marius the giraffe or other animals in zoos who could go on to have um, you know long lives it's not euthanasia that's what we do when we put dogs to sleep it's zoothanasia and god he didn't like this at all <laughs> <laughs> Just, well, and I, I think that plays, I, there's one part I wanted to ask you about. It's an anecdote that's written in the book that I absolutely love. And I see it coming up very regularly, particularly in regard to wildlife management and wildlife conservation, is that the scientists should not be advocates, uh -huh, that yeah. they need to be the, the, the cold, hard, this is the data, and that should inform the decision alone. And there's a, a wonderful anecdote, and I'd love if you could share that uh, rather than me try and retell it. Yeah, I mean, I, a couple of years ago, <coughs> I was going to Sydney, Australia. I go there a bit, and um, the Center for uh, 
the Center for Compassionate Conservation is at the University of Technology in Sydney. And they asked me to give a talk on compassionate conservation. So I called my talk, my call, I called my talk, would you kill your dog for fun? And um, they expected a small crowd and they got a lot of people. <laughs> and as I was talking, you know, I was making these analogies about dogs because I like dogs to fill what we call the empathy gap. Like you won't treat your dog in a certain way, but you'll allow other animals to be treated in the most egregious ways. And I, people concluded that no, they wouldn't kill their dog for fun. And we shouldn't be most, many people concluded we shouldn't kill kangaroos for fun like they do in Australia. And at the end of the talk, a guy stood up and said, Hey, you know, you're a scientist and scientists should not be activists or advocates. And I said, well, first you know, of all, science is an objective. And second of all, I knew who the guy was. I said, you're an activist and an advocate too. And he said, well, no, I'm not. And I said, sure you are. You're advocating and you're an activist in favor of killing kangaroos in, for food and for sport. And I'm against it. So how do we differ? We're just on, you know, opposite sides of the same coin. And it got really quiet. And it wasn't an argument with him. But afterwards, he said, yeah, you know, maybe you're right. And I said, you know, I'm not trying to be in your face. He's, he's otherwise a really nice guy. It's just that don't tell me that I can't be an advocate for the animals, but it's okay for you to be an advocate against them. This comes out in the exclusion of rats and mice in the Animal Welfare Act. I wrote a paper called, Where Have All the Scientists Gone? No scientists are coming out and debating. There's no debate there. They're not demanding that mice and rats be put back in the animal kingdom. Yeah, that, that one's really surprising. And we had um, the Animal and Science Policy Institutes, uh, which is up in Vancouver, and uh, the executive director, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Ormandy, uh, provide us a presentation and a webinar. And what is, I think, perhaps most revealing about that is that there are new technologies emerging constantly to replace animal testing. Yet yeah. animal testing is not going away. Um, which again, and, and that is the question is, it, I think it probably comes down to the scientists saying, look, we can do a bet. We can do better for these animals. We can do better for our jobs. We can do better for the world. Um, but you have to stand up and say that. You can't sort of just well, wait for it to happen. Right, and a, lo a lot of the scientists fear they'll lose their jobs, and a lot of them make a lot of money off it. So I always tell people it's understandable from that point of view, but they could do. There's a number of different alternatives too. So non-animal alternatives, of course, would be favored, but there's a lot of different ways to do different sorts of research that are not invasive, okay? And one of, the, one of the strongest arguments today that's coming out in a lot of branches of science is that more humane treatment of the animals results in more reliable data. And, you know, that in so many studies, what you're reporting on is the behavior of a stressed laboratory chimpanzee, monkey, rat, or mouse, say, or, or goldfish. So when people improve the care and the treatment of the animals, they also improve the reliability of the data. And, you know, as a field biologist, you know, you could know this too, that we know now that certain instruments, radio collars, certain ways in which we observe animals affects their behavior. And so we need to be sure that we're not studying the behavior of an animal in a particular situation that only applies to that animal in that particular situation. Yep. And uh, I think a really neat example of that that was listed in the book is the uh, penguins with tiny little receivers or cameras on them. Uh, yeah. We're showing like a, a statistically significant decline in foraging ability. Um, and there's the, 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 the little bits of technology weren't impacting them at all, but it was a change in their, their environments that was affecting them. Yeah. That's, they call the instrument effect. It affects their diving. Right. 
Right. And then there's been studies on cheetahs that show that radio collars of a certain weight do not affect their behavior at all. So we need to know that too. And then there are studies on rodents that show that um, uh, transmitters that weigh a certain percentage or more of their body weight influence movement and dominance. So, so it's not to say that all of these intrusions affect the data, but we need to know which ones do and which ones don't. Yeah. And that brings us back into that interesting paradox of um, testing on animals to find out whether or not we should test on animals. Uh, um, yes. But uh, I now we don't have too much more time, and I feel like we could probably sit and talk about this for hours and hours and hours. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I strongly encourage people who, uh, like, you know, not only are interested in wildlife or, or farm animals, not typically just that crowd, but people who love pets, because you do talk a bit about that. And that is one of the parts of the book that, again, makes me uncomfortable, which is a compliment. Um, <laughs> because I, you know, I, I am a very, a very big lover of dogs. I have dogs. I do everything I can to sort of give them the best life possible. But sure. reading that, I wonder, am I doing everything? You know, uh, JJ, uh, the, the hound mix, um, you know, she, as I, I mentioned to you before the call and as other listeners know, uh, she's the one who likes to hang out with me. You know, the rest of the stuff doesn't matter much, but she's yep. also part hound. So should I be letting her hang out in our backyard more and just sniff, you know, just let her have that total leisure time to do what she wants uh, and, you know, often she will, I'll try and get her to do that. And she'll say, nope, I want to go inside and sit on the couch. But, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question to pose to ourselves and to put ourselves yeah. in that uncomfortable position of, am I doing enough? Yeah. And if you allow her to make that choice, it may say, you know, she may say to you, oh, I, you know, on a given day, I want to go out on a given day. I want to stay in. I used to, when I lived in the mountains, the dogs with whom I shared my house, were almost literally never on leashes and almost never wore collars. I let them do what they want. There were days when they'd want to go, um, Jethro would want to go on a 10 mile walk in the morning and he had an hour, an hour and a half to do whatever he wanted. And there were some days he went out and laid down in front of my house and went to sleep. Yeah. I would walk up the driveway to see what's going on. And if he followed and kept walking with me, it was his hour. Sometimes he went home. So, it's respecting them for whom they are. And, and so I know this interview is about the animal's agenda, but Jessica Pierce, my co-author, wrote a wonderful book last year called Run, Spot, Run about the ethics of pet keeping, where she raises those issues. It's not an anti-pet keeping book, but it's more to stress, as we do in the animal's agenda, that pets are captive animals. Mm -hmm. Dogs are tethered. When dogs are on their own, they sniff about 33% of the time, for example. And so that's why I just, when I let my dogs out, it's their day. There were days I really wanted to go on a long run and I'd let them out. And if they just went back to sleep, then I would put them in their outdoor run and go for a run and come back and give them another choice. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, they have moods and they get headaches and they have temperaments like ours. So sometimes they want to run and sometimes they don't, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think, you know, again, very, very briefly, JJ is, I think, the perfect example of that. Um, yeah. My wife is involved in dog training and agility and performances. Mm -hmm. um, and JJ's been given the opportunity to go on the long walks or jogs. She's given the opportunity to play the games yep. and she doesn't want to, you know, I'll take her on a walk and I like to, uh, to go geocaching. I used to go on long hikes and camping, try taking her with me. And after half an hour or so, she'd start slowing down. If I stopped, she'd turn around, and start walking home. Yep. Like that literally her saying, nope, I don't want to do this anymore. Well, it's particularly important too, with older animals, senior citizens, because we've all, you know, anybody who's lived with a dog at some point has had a dog pass away or you've had to put them to sleep. And because my dogs had so many freedoms in their lives because they knew to avoid certain areas where there were cougars and black bears and coyotes, never had a run in with any of them. But, you know, it was great they could be out. And one of the things I learned as Jethro in particular got old was 
I'd open the door and it was his hour. Sometimes he was old, he was arthritic. He just wasn't, he was having a bad day. He'd walk up the driveway, sniff for a half hour. I'd stand there with him and talk to him and go home. And some mornings he'd walk out and he'd be beelining down to the bike path. It was his hour. I mean, of course, I had to assess how he was feeling, knowing that if we walked three miles one way, we're going to have to walk three miles the other because he weighed 90 pounds and I couldn't carry <laughs> him but, but your point is such a good one, Michael, because our companion animals are captive and it's not a negative thing. But as Jessica points out in Run, Spot, Run, we need to remember that. It's pretty simple, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's it's a matter of listening by observing. Yep, um, yep. Now, I, I have a ton of notes on the wildlife stuff, um, and I don't actually need a lot of them because this is familiar ground for us. Um, and the thoughts that kind of popped into my head as I read about wildlife and what you wrote in here um, was – in one part, Manifest Destiny kind of kept coming up in the back of my mind. Uh -huh. And I've been reading and rereading the North American uh, model of wildlife conservation, which is the sort of overarching theme. Many, many, uh, I, I, I guess you pretty much call them state uh, mm -hmm. wildlife managers refer to. And people familiar with this document will all point to the same single flaw um, if they, they believe in this, uh, which I do, in that it presumes that wildlife is a resource that must be used. And that is, to me, sort of the crux of the evil of wildlife management, right. is that it's all these animals are seen as resources. Uh, they're talked about, as you mentioned, in population groups, never as individuals. And this is something we've talked about before. Uh, we, it comes up when we talk about compassionate converse, conservation. The one I wanted to hit on, though, was the, the owl versus owl subsection in one of these chapters. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to pull that up because that, to me, is an excellent example of when it's maybe not so obvious. Um, and this, the story that's referred to here is the... Um, uh, which owls? There's two types of owls. The barred owl... Um, and the snowies. And the stats, right. Thank you. Uh, no, spotted. Spotted, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the spotted owls who are critically endangered uh, in British Columbia. I believe they're also critically endangered. They are in the American Northwest, uh, too. And they are under siege also by barred owls who are much sturdier. They're larger. They're more aggressive. And they are doing better in terms yeah. of population uh, naturally. And they're coming into the areas where... where uh, uh, spotted owls live and taking over. Uh, the reason that the spotted owls are disappearing where the barred owls are is not entirely clear. Mm -hmm. But the conversation then becomes, we have a duty to protect these spotted owls. Mm -hmm. And we know that there's this obvious influence of barred owls coming in. Yep. And uh, there is a, a stakeholder group, that an ethicist was involved in, and, and I am not going to try and summarize this. Everyone should... Buy the book and read it because it's excellent, and they can look this up afterwards. Um, but the main note that you made is the fact that neither the spotted owl or the barred owl were on this stakeholder group talking about what should be done. Right. Um, how and and that comes up. Uh, you know, another example familiar to listeners is the wolves in Canada being killed to protect endangered caribou. Yeah. Um, you know, the 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 point is that in in actually both of these cases, logging plays a major role. And if we want to save both these species, we need to stop logging. But how do we resolve this within the current paradigm or do we require the paradigm shifts that you're advocating in order to get to a place where we can say, like, we like we, we can't kill, but we need to protect. And, you know, how do we, I, I don't even know how to say it or how to pose the question because to stop logging to most people, particularly those who live in these areas, would be economic suicide. Yeah. Uh, how do we yeah. sort of paint this picture in such a way that it becomes a reasonable conversation as opposed to sounding like crazy activists? Yeah, well, I mean, that, I mean, those are, yeah, I mean, there are, so, sometimes there aren't really easy answers. The owl versus owl one is interesting simply because 
even the experts who um, would like to save all the owls, a lot of them have agreed that killing one species to save the other species won't work. But, you know, once killing is off the table, people have to get a lot more creative. So scientists, a lot of our scientists are very creative and very smart, and they come up with very unique ways of studying various things. And if you just say, we're, we're closing down the killing fields, right? We're, we're no more blood. They'll come up with some solutions. They usually do. It's Killing is easy. I mean, and when I say it's easy, I know it's not necessarily easy for some people, but, you know, the guy who killed Mary as a giraffe and the guy who called him as he, a hero, it would be logical to say they just think killing is fine. It's an easy way to just, you know, do things. Killing the wolves to save caribou, it's, it's a different thing. It's different because you're killing a member of one species to save a member of another. The bottom line there, of course, is that most of the scientists agree that it has not and will not work. So it's it's a quick fix. And I think a lot of the wolf killing to kill save a caribou came from just an intensely an intense hatred slash and or maybe fear of predators. You know, I mean, no, I mean, I just, it's just not part of my day, if you will, to think about people thinking it's just fine to go trap, shoot from an airplane and poison snare um, uh, wolves to save caribou. It's just, it's sick. That's the only thing I can think. It's sick. And then you'd say, well, would you do it to a dog? No, we wouldn't do it to a dog. Then why would you do it to a wolf? Right. I mean. And I know people come up and go, well, the dogs don't harm the caribou, blah, 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 blah. My argument is I think there's people who like killing animals. And this is kind of their, if you will, legal or the license to do so. Um, I, I met a woman last year who proudly told me she's part of a conservation group, who looked me in the face and said that she enjoyed traveling around the world as a trophy hunter but she was a real ardent conservationist. I, my, my, my way of interacting with people like that is not to, and I don't say anything. A lot of people, maybe you get in an argument that you're bound to lose um, with anybody like that anyway. I didn't say a word. I, what, what was I going to say? You know, there she was bragging how she's a conservationist and she travels all over the world as a trophy huntress responsible for trophy corpses. The, the reason I'm making this statement is there's been studies, I wrote about one of them, that there are people who like killing other animals. I, I, they, say, they say, you know, I love them and I kill them and I always say I'm glad they don't love me. And that's a little facetious, but, but that's honestly how I feel, Michael. All right, and I think... What is fascinating is the concept of removing killing as an option. Uh, and uh -huh. the, way I, the way I picture this too is when we look in areas um, in, in Canada, for example, in Banff uh, National Park, um, where they, they really do avoid lethal measures at all costs in resolving conflicts um, and in communities where it's simply not practical, they come up with new ways, new things to try. And I think another example of that from a, a wildly different field that may actually be applicable is Apollo 13, that story. Mm -hmm. They had to fix it. They had to fix their shuttle with yeah, what yeah, they yeah. had on board. Yep. There were no other options. It was that or the end. And I think when we, particularly with the scientific community, when you put it to them in that way, that, this is what you can, like, these are the parameters with which you can work. Um, some remarkable things can really happen. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had laboratory scientists tell me that they do the science they do. They know that they're harming animals. And if they were told they couldn't do it anymore, say there's a six-month moratorium or that they were closing it down or in six months, they'd come up with other ways of doing the research. I've had them tell me that. And they do it out of convenience. And I'm not, I don't mean that as a criticism of them. They're paradigm scientists. They're, their mentors and their mentors' mentors 
have done the same thing. So if you just go in and you say, killing's off the table, and we've got a, quote, problem here, how are we going to solve it? And now you start getting those incredible high, incredibly high IQ people working. And I don't mean that facetiously. Some of the people I know who do horrific things to animals are really smart. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a utilitarian approach. Um, now, to, yes. to wrap up, I, I want to ask you, when we talk about these things and when we look at the theme of, of this book, uh, The Animal's Agenda, and say, we can change the world, and these are the many different ways in which we can do it. It's to someone, and this is how I felt at the time, uh, that is not necessarily understanding or, or is not at the place where they have chosen to eat a plant-based diet or have chosen to remove animal products from, all, or, uh, uh, from their shopping list when it comes to clothing and personal hygiene um, or who are you know still taking selfies with wildlife, which is one that drives me nuts personally. Um, it seems like a lot when we say we want you to change your life. Yep. What would be the place you would ask people to start? If there was one, like, because again, we, we can't expect the world to, to just overall change completely overnight. Um, everyone sort of has to take their own path on this. Where would you ask people or where would you suggest people start if they want to start making the world uh, um, the, the free place that it should be for all animals? Yeah, well, I think that making it the free place for all animals is down the pike, to be honest with you. But one thing I always tell people, you, you don't have to eat factory farmed animals or animal products. Stop. If people stop buying factory industrial, industrial industrially produced animals, then the slaughterhouses would close. Because in terms of pain and suffering, more pain and suffering goes on in the an animal industrial food complex than in every other area combined. So that would be where I would say, then I, then of course, you know, you could make your gradation. You can say, okay, you're going to not any longer eat factory farmed animals. And maybe you could use that at the beginning to phasing animals and animal products out of your, um, out of your meal plan. That also helps people to think about who these animals are. So, you know, they might think, yeah, you know, that cow I ate yesterday really um, was a sentient being, like my dog. So what I'm trying to say here, Michael, is, you know, depends on what, you know, you know depends on how, what their lifestyle is like, but, but pick something and then start bringing it into their everyday life. And so, you know, maybe, um, They'll begin to expand that kind of empathy and compassion to lab animals, zoo animals, entertainment animals, pets, and wild animals. Um, try to explain to them when why do they run to Yellowstone to see certain – Yellowstone National Park or Banff National Park to see certain animals and how they love them and all that. And then they go knock off a Big Mac. So – it's pointing out inconsistencies, but always, always in a nice way, because the minute you get into an argument or put someone on the defensive, you might as well go home. The Animal's Agenda is available online and wherever books are sold. To learn more about Mark or find his other books, visit his website at markbeckoff.com. You can also read his regular column on animal behavior at psychologytoday.com. That's it for this week, folks. I hope you enjoyed the show and check out Mark's book. It was a wonderful read for me. Until next time, this is Michael Howie for Defender Radio reminding you to stay informed and stay strong.